um, what we're going to do for the next 45 minutes, um, as Rashma said, is just um, we're going to go through some deep neck space anatomy. So what I'll do is divide it into three. Um, it's very odd just looking at your own screen, but I think as radiologists, we're quite used to this kind of level of teaching. I'm going to show you just the basic um, kind of neck space anatomy, how we subdivide the neck. And then I'm going to show you on a, on a scan how we then apply that. And then I've got a few little cases at the end where you can then apply the anatomy. So as I said, what we're going to do, <clears throat> going to review the neck space anatomy. We're going to show you what it looks like on a scan. And then, as I said, a few cases at the end where we'll apply it. So we'll start off first slide. I, I always tell our juniors, not you don't really have to commit all the different names of the fascial neck spaces, just um, an awareness of the fact that we can divide the neck into these kind of superficial cervical fascia or around the outside, and then your kind of deeper layers of deep uh, kind of investing cervical fascia, which you can divide again into a superficial, middle, and deeper layers. So if we start with the superficial neck, as you guys, you guys are probably more au fait than I am in terms of operating on people's neck, you have the outer superficial cervical fascia, which encompasses the platysma, which runs from mandible down to the anterior chest, kind of pectoralis, deltoid muscles. That's the superficial fascia all the way around the neck, encompasses the neck all the way down. Then as you go deeper, you then have the, these various layers. So that again, you have a superficial layer of the, super, of the deep cervical fascia that in, in, encases the two sternocleidomastoid muscles, trapezius muscles on the outside, and again, envelops the whole of the neck, and on the back, is a you have attachments to the spinous processes, back end of the spine. So that's the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia. You then have a, another layer, which is kind of the kind of pretracheal fascia, which encompasses this space that you're going to we'll come on to is the um, visceral space, also encompasses some of the strap muscles, and most of the upper aerodigestive tract is within this location. So the kind of pharynx, larynx, upper trachea, thyroid, esophagus. So that's the kind of middle layer. I'll come on to the carotid and retropharyngeal spaces in a moment, but the deepest layer, so again, subdivide it into three, so superficial, middle, and the deep, which is the perivertebral fascia, which goes all the way around the um, cervical spine, spinal cord, all your paravertebral muscles, this is the prevert, kind of perivertebral fascia. As I said, gonna, special attention to the carotid spaces on both sides, so in red here, they have contributions from different, different uh, fascial layers, envelops the internal carotid, the jugular, vagus nerve within the carotid space. You have this other area here, which is the retropharyngeal space. So behind the kind of the visceral space, you have this the retropharyngeal space, and you have this kind of alar fascia that also um, can then subdivide it into what we call the danger space, which is behind. Now, um, I'm gonna talk about um, neck space anatomy, but also introduce a few infections. So the danger space is quite important if you're on call, the retropharyngeal, any infectious inflammatory process can then spread through into this danger space, which can then freely go down into the mediastinum. So better shown here, this is a sagittal view, the same neck spaces. You have the, if you can picture it in your mind, the superficial fascia enveloping the whole of the neck. You then have the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia running on the front here. Attachments there to the hyoid and runs down to the manubrium. The purple layer being the kind of pretracheal middle layer of that cervical fascia enveloping all of the kind of pharynx, um, larynx, upper trachea and as you go further back you'll have the fascial layer that runs all the way down the neck, the retropharyngeal space and the orange line that you can probably see there, the kind of pre-vertebral fascia. So this is the area where you start to get retropharyngeal problems, danger space and you can see how it can freely communicate down into the upper mediastinum. Right so now that we've introduced some of those fascial layers remember the, um, you can then further then subdivide, this is what we tend to do on call, divide it into supra and infrahyoid neck. So in the suprahyoid neck, uh, there are lots of different compartments that you need to be aware of. So um, if we start off, I'm going to start from the middle and outwards. So this is all nicely color coded. So if we start in the middle, this is as radiologists what we call the pharyngeal mucosal space. So this light blue area. So here we're at the level of the nasopharynx. You've got the um, torus tabarius, the opening of the station tube, pharyngeal recess, all of this is your pharyngeal mucosal space and the continuation superiorly is the kind of middle layer of that cervical fascia envelops all of this pharyngeal mucosal space all the way around. So then behind that as I showed you is a superior extension of the retropharyngeal space and then out laterally is one of the most important spaces for us which is the parapharyngeal space which you can see here. 
So paraphangeal space um, will, in infections, will, can be involved with tumours below the skull base. It's very useful. So if you've got any lumps or bumps in these fascial spaces, the displacement of this paraphangeal fat can often be a clue as to where the pathology is coming from. So as opposed to writing a report saying clinical correlation, as a radiologist, if you know roughly which space and where that fat's going, you can narrow your differential diagnosis. So if it's a pharyngeal mucosal space problem, so that's normally things like squamous cell carcinomas, minor salivary gland tumors, it will typically come out and push this fat out laterally and posteriorly. If we come out laterally here, this purple area enveloped, so kind of the contribution from the kind of superficial layers of the cervical fascia envelop these two spaces that we'll introduce next. So this purple area is the masticator space. So it does what it says on the tin. You've got all the muscles of mastication. So masseter muscle, temporalis, medial and lateral pterygoids. It has a quite a large kind of surface area connection with the, um, the skull base. And with all these deep neck spaces, you want to think of the contents, and particularly if you're up at the skull base, also thinking about what vessels or nerves could run through it. So for the masticator space, bearing in mind that then you have the V3 division of the trigeminal nerve that will freely communicate. So particularly if you've got lumps and bumps and tumours, you can get perineural spread from the masticator space via V3 foramen ovale into the intracranial compartment. So that's masticator space. The other thing is to bear in mind is because of the association with the temp temporalis, you've got, we can then subdivide that further into infrazygomatic and suprazygomatic, which I'll show you in a moment. Behind that, again, you've got another fascial covering of this green area. So this is the parotid space. So again, in the parotid space, nicely named, has parot the parotid gland within it. You've got the retromandibular vein, branches of the external carotid, and importantly, thinking of your facial nerve that runs through from the stylomastoid foramen, running through that parotid space to go and supply your muscles of facial expression. So if we come back to that paraphangeal space, if you've got a lump or bump in the masticator space, if you think of the contents, it's going to either come from bone or muscles, things like sarcomas, um, or in, if you've got odontogenic infections that can then spread. And if you've got a masticator space problem, what will happen is it'll push the paraphangeal fat medially and posteriorly. Okay, if we come further posteriorly, if you've got a parotid space lump or bump, particularly if you've got deep lobe pathology, what, what it'll do to the fat is it'll actually push the fat anterior medially. So when you've got large pleos in the deep lobe, you can often give a very narrow differential by looking at that displacement of the parapharyngeal fat. Okay, so just to recap, pharyngeal mucosal space, we've got the retropharyngeal space. Out laterally, we're going to come on to first the parapharyngeal space. And remember, you can further subdivide that into your pre and post styloid, depending on its relationship to the styloid process as you come laterally, masticator space, parotid space. And then here nicely on this diagram, nicely colored in red is the carotid space. So in terms of the contents of the carotid space, again, fairly simplistic, it's got the carotid vessel, internal jugular vein, you'll have the uh, vagus nerve that will run through and the carotid space runs all the way from the skull base down to your um, um, upper mediastinum and thorax. And much like the perivertebral space that I'll come on to, it runs all the way down the neck. Um, other thing with the carotid space is just relationship. Remember that communicates up with the jugular foramen. So you've got all your lower cranial nerves, the glossopharyngeal accessory nerves that will come out. Remember the ninth nerve will go off and supply innervation to the um, upper pharynx. The accessory nerve will come off the back to supply your sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. And the vagus nerve will run down the neck and have contributions in terms of your laryngeal nerves, etc., and go down, all the way down to the mediastinum. And the other thing to bear in mind is the hypoglossal nerve will come out from the skull base, will wrap around the carotid space before going forward to it, um, going to the oral cavity and supply the tongue. So carotid space, and then the last space to mention here is this outlined in blue is the perivertebral space. So particularly if you're on call and you've got someone um, who's, got, who's got neck pain, you can't see anything in the deep spaces, always have a check here. We work in East London, so we see uh, probably a disproportionate level of TB that can arise from the spine, but you've got other things, spondylodiscitis, facet joint ar uh, septic arthritis that can all arise in this perivertebral space and give you pain. How you can identify it is often it'll push these fat layers forward. So if you've got pathology in your cervical spine, it'll often push your retropharyngeal fat forward and anteriorly. Okay, so that's on a sagittal view. This is a coronal view, and then we're gonna introduce another couple of spaces here related to the oral cavity.
So just to recap, I mentioned about the masticator space and the fact that it's quite extensive. We've got a large kind of, um, kind of surface area with the skull base. There's the zygoma. So you can see here, you've got to communicate there with that suprazygomatic masticator space related to that temporalis muscle. So you can have significant odontogenic infections that can track all the way up and you can get pus spreading all the way up the neck uh, to the side of the skull. So that's masticator space, again, showing you relationship. That's the parapharyngeal fat plane. Now you can see how that goes all the way up from the skull base. You can track it all the way down, all the way down. And here it's got a free communication. So remember a lot of these fascial spaces are not completely closed off. So you can get, particularly with neck sepsis, they can all communicate. Here, the parapharyngeal fat, you can follow all the way down. And the two spaces to introduce here, again, is the sublingual space. So under the tongue, you have the sublingual salivary gland, the sublingual space. And remember, anteriorly, that communi can communicate in the anterior floor of mouth. So typically what we see on call is kind of salivary gland issues, if you've got stone or infections in the floor of mouth, but more commonly, uh, odontogenic infections. So particularly if you've got infected anterior teeth, so your anterior kind of canines, incisors, if you've got um, a carious tooth that can then spread into the sublingual space. If you go posteriorly, that freely communicates with the submandibular space. So the submandibular space that you can see here, again, does what it says on the tin, you've got the submandibular gland, so you've got the superficial lobe, and then you've got the deep lobe that wraps around the kind of the free edge of the mylohyoid. So you can see how an odontogenic infection can spread into that space. And then it can also go into your parapharyngeal fat, go all the way up to the skull base, or as I'll show you, can track all the way down the neck. So you can see how these additional spaces, so sublingual, submandibular, they're better seen on your imaging if you change it into a coronal plane. Right. So that's suprahyoid neck. Once you start to get below the hyoid bone, it becomes a little bit easier. As I said, there are a few spaces that will communicate all the way down the neck. So if we start here, again, this is what CT scan is going to look like. You're not going to have all those nice color pictures. You're going to have to kind of picture where you think the superficial and these kind of different fascial layers are. The superficial fascia is slightly easier because here you can see the thin line is the platysma. So just for the cases later on, when you're looking at CT scans, when you start off as a junior, the pathology if you, is often identified if you look at fat planes. So here you can see this is nice, low density fat, nice and clean. There's a thin platysma, so that's the superficial uh, fascia. And then you've got the um, kind of superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia here. You can imagine it's gonna be wrapping around the sternocleidomastoid. You've got the trapezius muscle on the back, that's gonna be deeper. And then you've got the different spaces. So the middle cervical fascial layer is gonna envelop this, which is the visceral space. So this is the level of the larynx. And then you've got the, if you picture the carotid space is going to have contributions from all these different fascial layers. So as you get below the infrahyoid neck, you have some of these additional fat filled spaces. So you've got here, this is the, what you guys will commonly refer to as the anterior triangle in the neck. You've got the anterior cervical space, which is just padded with fat. And then posteriorly, this is the posterior cervical space. Again, mainly fat filled. You'll have a few lymph nodes, blood vessels. And in the back of the neck, remember your accessory nerve is going to be running through. And then color coded here, you've got perivertebral space that will run all the way around. And you can see there, thin strip of fat, that's the retropharyngeal space. So infrahyoid neck, it becomes much easier. There are only a few spaces that you need to be aware of, whereas the suprahyoid neck below the skull base is a little bit more complex. So what we're going to do next, second part, is then how does that translate? So this is a, an MRI scan. So this is a T1 weighted sequence. So Again, your scans aren't going to come with these nice color-coded pictures. Um, what we, a lot of our juniors use, for the, it's kind of the surgeons in the group, which you all are, is a website called Radiopedia, which is a very good source of information. Most of us as radiologists will have our scan and Radiopedia right next to it. So this is going to show you how it then, all those spaces then translate onto your neck imaging. So this is a T1 weighted sequence. Why would I use that? It gives beautiful delineation of your anatomy. And more importantly, you get a beautiful view of all your fat. So on a T1 weighted sequence, fat is bright. Yeah. So it was particularly useful when you're looking at pathologies around the skull base, because all the skull base is going to be full of marrow fat. So again, all of these osseous structures around the skull base are going to be T1 bright. They're full of nice fatty marrow. So if we start up at the skull base, again, we'll recap the anatomy again. The purple area now, this is the, the pharyngeal mucosal space that I mentioned. So here we're at the level of the nasopharynx, and as you come down, 
level of oropharynx. So this purple area is all of your pharyngeal mucosal space. Remember, you've got the fascial layer around it, the constrictor muscle planes all around it. Lateral to that, this light blue area, that's the parapharyngeal fat plane. Yep, so it should be nice, bright on the T1. So that's a recap, if you've got pharyngeal mucosal space pathology, it can go and push and displace the parapharyngeal fat laterally and posteriorly. The green area as we come out laterally, that's your masticator space. So here you can see nicely, that's the, um, that's the posterior end of the mandible, again, full of nice fatty marrow, that's the inferior dental nerve canal. And again, on the MRI, the cortex, again, is dense cortical bone, so that's gonna be very low signal. So there's mandible, surrounded by all your muscles of mastication. If you go further north, I mentioned an important relationship. I don't know if I've encompassed it here, but there's your foramen ovale, so your V3 division of the trigeminal communicates with that masticator space. More anteriorly, just to introduce another little fatty filled area is the buccal fat plane, which you can see here. Uh, not much to um, think of here really in terms of structures, but you've got the parotid gland here, runs forward, the parotid duct, and that opens up, pierces the buccinator at the level of the upper second molar. But this is all nice, clean fat. So particularly when you're looking at scans in terms of sinonasal pathology, you, uh, particularly invasive infections, you want to look at these kind of retroantral and pre-maxillary fat planes. So that's all nice and clean. Masticator space, then behind it here is your parotid space, light purple. So again, within that space is you've got the retromandibular vein, branches of the external carotid, and importantly is your facial nerve. So there's the stylomastoid foramen. So if you picture it, that's going to hit into that light blue area. That's the mastoid tip. That's the styloid process. The facial nerve is going to be coming out and then freely communicating into the purple space. So that's the parotid space, masticator space, parapharyngeal, pharyngeal mucosal space. Nicely in red here, if you can picture it on the other side, is your carotid space. So carotid artery, jugular vein, vagus nerve, that's going to run all the way down the neck. Okay, only a few structures you have to think of when you've got carotid space pathology. So is it the carotid glomus lump, for example? Is it a vagal nerve lump? And sometimes you've got a few lymph nodes that can reside in the carotid space. So carotid space there, if we go back further up to the skull base, we come medially, this, the blue area here is the perivertebral space, as I said, that fascia that's encompassing all of the spine. You can see spinal cord there, that's the anterior arch of C1. These are your prevertebral muscles. And then you have here these lines, which is the retropharyngeal and danger spaces that will also run all the way down the neck. Okay, so right up to the skull base, and then you follow it all the way down. So that's your retropharyngeal and danger spaces. In front of that, this purple continuation is the visceral space, which I mentioned. And then the final thing to mention, if we go up, is the floor of mouth anatomy again. So this kind of darker brown color is the sublingual space, so the sublingual gland there on the other side. So remember that's sublingual, all that is kind of, uh, you've got the mylohyoid muscle, which kind of forms like the pelvic floor of the mouth. So it holds everything up. So there's the sublingual space. And you can see how that freely communicates with this lighter green area. There's the submandibular gland. Yep, so you've got the superficial lobe and the deeper lobe that will wrap around the free edge here. So this is the mylohyoid muscle. Yep, so you can see how that freely communicates sublingual and submandibular. And then you can see how that communicates with the parapharyngeal space, how it, pathologies can go all the way up to the skull base. And likewise, inferiorly in the neck, that's going to then blend into the anterior cervical space. So this is infrahyoid neck. So just again, same spaces, visceral space, retropharyngeal slash danger space, perivertebral space, carotid space, and your anterior and posterior cervical spaces in front and behind. Okay, so that's how you can then translate all those neck spaces onto a scan. Now, I'm just gonna flip. Don't worry, these are all anonymized. So we've done about 20 minutes. So the next 20 minutes, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you a few cases. So if you select cases here, and we're going to go through and how you can apply that anatomy. So this was deep neck space anatomy with some uh, on-call infections and emergency work. So this, um, if I reset it, hold on, just going to change that onto the bone. So this is a temporal bone scan. This is uh, the history for this. You'll probably know the diagnosis if I mention it. This was an elderly patient with um, ear pain and they were diabetic. So I'm just going to show you the temporal bone first and then we'll focus on the MRI scan. So for those of you who are not used to looking at these, I'm just going to split the screen. The beauty of having a normal side is you can then 
compare and contrast. So a lot of radiology is glorified spot the difference. So if we look at the normal side on this side, just make that bigger actually. So just for comparison, let me just put the, I'll put the overview of both sides, there we go. So on the normal side here, got, that's your nice normal external auditory canal. So just magnify this a little bit. So you've got the cartilaginous external auditory canal, there's your bony external auditory canal here, you can see the tympanic membrane. This is all lovely in terms of nicely aerated, that's middle ear cleft, mastoid antrum, mastoids all beautifully aerated as is the external auditory canal. Here, as you know, with diabetic, poorly controlled diabetic ear pain, your thought process is, is this is an otitis externa, which you can see here, there is, there's some soft tissue thickening there, an external auditory canal. So then your job as the radiologist is then to tell the ENT team about the bones. So you can see here, some of this bone has been nibbled away. So that's the kind of bony EACs. You've got some bony erosive change. So this is a necrotizing as opposed to a simple otitis externa. So you can see here, all of this middle ear mastoid cavity is all completely opacified. Now, this is a temporal bone CT, so mainly bony information. So um, you then will want to supplement that, particularly if you've got problems with um, ear pain, facial nerve palsy. Uh, you then want to know the exact true extent of the, of the process. So this will then start to apply some of that um, deep neck space anatomy. So this is a T1 weighted sequence. So again, it's really good for anatomical detail. And again, you don't have to be a radiologist. To There's a difference here between right and left. So what we'll do is we'll start off. So this is a, with the otitis externa, typically starts in that uh, external auditory canal. You remember you've got the fissures of Santorini, so this can then extend inferiorly. So you can see that one of the first ports of call is the TMJ. So remember the TM joint is kind of part of that masticator space. So you can see here already there's some difference in the signal between right and left. There are the pterygoids on the other side. And remember fat is your friend as a radiologist. Here you can see normal fat plane. And on the contralateral side, this is a little bit ill-defined, some of this fat. So you know this process from the canal has then gone into the TMJ. You also then want to look at the marrow signal within the, the mandibular condyle. And here you could argue, you can't see the complete cortical outline of that mandibular condyle. So you're worried that the infection's propagated into the TMJ. If you go medially, remember the other neck spaces, if we start from out to in this time, the parapharyngeal fat plane, you can see here beautifully. Yeah, nice, beautiful parapharyngeal fat. You can see all the way down and here, it's, can we call it dirty fat as radiologists? It means that it's, there's something going on. So this is all inflammatory change, which has gone into that parapharyngeal fat plane. Yep, so that's involved. So the infection spread from the ear canal, TMJ, it's gone medially, parapharyngeal fat plane is gone. And then you're also worried, that has this gone into the pharyngeal mucosal space? Here you've got a nice view. You've got the, um, the palatine muscles that you can see nicely, fat planes in here, it's all been filled in. Okay, so you've probably got involvement there at the pharyngeal mucosal space. Can't really see the constrictor muscle plane very nicely. Parapharyngeal fat is involved. Okay, what other neck spaces can I think of? Again, if you think further back, you've got the carotid space. So there's the flow voids. Remember with MRI scans, um, if you've got flowing blood, the flowing blood has protons which won't generate signal because by the time, when as you're going through the scan, the blood moves on. So you, the with the MRI scans, always looking at these dark holes, these are your vascular flow voids. So there's the flow void of the internal carotid artery on the left, which is normal. And you can see here, that's attenuated. So it's a different caliber and you've got all of this signal around it. So it's gone into the masticator space, parapharyngeal space, pharyngeal mucosal space, and into the carotid space. Now that's gonna be a problem for you. There's gonna be risks of uh, vessels, particularly with infection mycotic aneurysms, et cetera, patency of the jugular vein. Have they got a complicating jugular venous thrombosis? And here they haven't, it still looks patent, okay? And then the problem is once it gets into these deep neck spaces, you're then worried about superior extension into the skull base. And here, if we come down to the level of the clivus, you can see that's normal cortical bone, nice fatty marrow signal. And here you can see it's a little bit patchy. So then you're worried that now this has become a necrotizing entitis externa and you've got potential skull base osteomyelitis. Now these are horrible infections. The imaging will look uh, abnormal for quite a long period of time. Um, kind of following these patients up can be really difficult in terms of knowing whether it's improved. Um, 
often we'll do sequential MR scanning, some centers use white cell scanning, but uh, very difficult. But um, the main thing for this case was to show you how you can then start to apply some of that deep neck space anatomy and how you can apply it to your scanning. So, right, we'll just go on to the next case. This is not a very common condition, but it's useful to be aware of. I know this is a slightly historical, this is a plain x-ray. Um, now, in East London, we have a high population of Bengali patients that all love eating their fish. So we do a lot of lateral x-rays looking for fish bones. So whenever you're looking um, at these lateral x-rays, looking for any kind of radiopaque densities, remembering where they're commonly going to be impacted, you know, region of the tongue base, can it be um, impacted lower down? Here, if you take as a guide, if you're looking, this patient presented with neck pain, elevated CRP, if you go down to the level of kind of C3, C4, the pre-vertebral soft tissues shouldn't measure more than about seven millimeters. At the level of C4 and below, you can have up to 21 millimeters. And here, you can see this is all filled out, it's quite thick. Okay, so you, this patient's got kind of neck pain, the back of the throat all looked quite edematous. So this is abnormal kind of, swelling so which space is it going to be in so if we move on this is the ct neck from the sun patient so i'm going to show you the axial imaging with contrast first and then the sagittal view um, unfortunate problem with dental amalgam can make the imaging really hard and then often then you'll often get multiple reformats in coronal and sagittal planes so here if we look at the neck we come down you can see if we look at the fat Okay, so this is nice clean fat. If we go down into the lower neck, that's your anterior cervical space. This is nice dark fat. And actually your retropharyngeal space should also be full of dark fat. And here you can see it where that thickening was. It's a bit kind of um, ill-defined. It's much kind of this dark gray. So you don't know is, is this um, inflammation? Certainly doesn't look like an abscess. So just gonna show you what it looks like on a sagittal view. So this is the sagittal view from the same patient. Okay, so all of the these tissues here, so you know, in terms of spaces, what space could it potentially be in? So one of the things you're going to do, is there something wrong with the spine? So looking at the bones, could it be something that's come from the cervical kind of perivertebral space and gone forward? And here the bones look normal. So just word of caution, particularly with TB, TB can cause a lot of destructive change before they finally present to you. So just um, bear in mind with neck pain, it's not always these anterior neck soft tissues that can come from cervical spine, making sure you look at all the facet joints, your discs, do they all look fine? There's nothing here to suggest there's a spondylodiscitis or septic arthritis, all of this looks okay. But the main problem here is you still got this soft tissue thickening, which is in the, not really gonna be in the perivertebral space, you're talking mainly of retropharyngeal space here. And uh, there's an additional finding here that was the cause. So this is can often catch people out on call almost can mimic like a tonsillitis or a pharyngitis but actually this patient has a if I window it has a little bit of of a blob of calcium so actually this was so technically speaking this is within the perivertebral space because it's the prevertebral muscles this is a focus of amorphous calcification so this was a calcific tendonitis and that had then caused this pre kind of prevertebral retropharyngeal edema and the neck pain so Key here is not to put a needle into these patients can often look like there's, there's going to be an abscess at the back of the throat. But uh, when you do the scan, you can see this little, these lumps of calcium. These are, this is a calcific tendonitis um, and often non-steroidals and conservative management and they tend to improve. Right, so I've been going for half an hour, two more cases, which should take about 10 minutes and then we can take questions. So this is um, kind of standard fare for um, East London, I'm afraid. So this is, um, we start at the top when you're looking at the scan. So if, when you're first starting out and looking at CT scans, having a knowledge of those neck spaces is very useful in terms of having a structured approach. So if we start at the top here, nasopharynx looks slightly asymmetrical here on the one side. So again, looking at your fat planes and you can see here, this is your parapharyngeal fat. There's your masticator space. This parapharyngeal fat is nice and clean. And here is slightly ill-defined. So there's some inflammatory fat stranding. As we come further down in the neck, you can see here, there's a problem here in the floor of the mouth. So if you compare the fat from the, this is the fat on the back of the neck. And if you compare that to the fat here, we call this inflammatory fat stranding. So there's obviously something going on in that space. You then look often the platysma will start to get slightly thickened. So if we start to come here and you can see that there's a problem here. This is the 
that symphysis of the mandible, there's some low density here. I'm going to show you the coronal in a moment, but there's looks like there's a problem here in that submental possible floor of mouth location. And you can see how this has gone across the midline. So you can see here, can't really clearly make out either submandibular salivary gland. Follow that down, there's the hyoid. So that's suprahyoid neck, and there's also infrahyoid neck involvement. All of this is inflamed and stranded. So what could possibly have caused this? So this is a CT scan, could have been salivary in origin. Is there a stone that you can see in the submandibular gland? No, not really. Remember, your, your stones are going to hide in that kind of anterior floor of mouth, it can be hidden if there's streak artifact. One of the other things to do is you get CT scans and you can change the window settings. So that's a soft tissue window setting. This is a bone window setting. So again, very useful when you're looking at um, kind of the dentition. And this patient, as you can see, had multiple dental extractions on the right side. And you can see here, if you look at the bone, there's a little bit of dehiscence there on the lingual plate of the way that posterior molar would have been. There's the inferior dental nerve canal. It's, that looks like it's probably gonna be intact, but you can see there's a little bony defect. So then you're probably gonna to angle towards this being an odontogenic sepsis, particularly with a history of uh, dental extraction. So as I said, going back, applying those neck spaces to a, a coronal view. So this is the coronal equivalent. So again, the coronal is really useful when you're looking at floor of mouth pathology. So here, <clears throat> if we go through some of the anatomy, there's the genioglossus muscle. That's the extrinsic tongue muscle. There's the oral cavity, oral tongue. And you can see here all of this phlegminous inflammatory change that it looks like it's probably below or the level of the mylohyoid, but you can see how it follows all the way back. There probably is an oral cavity component as well. So that infection has probably seeded into that space. So here is the sublingual space. So this patient only had right-sided dental extractions. There was nothing on the left, but just you can see how this can all communicate through the anterior floor of mouth. You can see how this is now tracked back onto the left side uh, and this tracked all the way back into the left. There's the left submandibular space communicating with the left sublingual space. And you can, as I showed you before, the parapharyngeal space on this side, you can see there beautifully, this is normal parapharyngeal fat. And here, this is all inflamed. So even though it was a right-sided dental extraction, it extended across midline and gone all the way into the left neck. So this was a, um, a developing kind of Ludwig's angina. You can see how that, with the inflammatory mass, how that can start to cause problems with your airway, elevating the tongue. You can see both submandibular spaces involved. And as I showed you on the axial, that can then spread into the anterior and exoft tissues. Most of this was suprahyoid, but there was an infrahyoid component. And if we go further back, you can see the bulk of that inflammatory change and how that's compromising the airways, pushed to the side. Okay, and then the other complications, particularly when you're in the middle of the night, if you're on your own looking at the scan, the complicating features when you've got neck sepsis is firstly trying to work out where you think it's come from. So in this case, we think this is odontogenic. Once you think it's odontogenic, then working out your spaces. So here, you'd say this is kind of widespread involvement of the floor of mouth, sublingual spaces. There's a submental involvement, involvement of both submandibular spaces. You've got posterior spread into the parapharyngeal deep neck spaces and significant anterior extent. So where's the septus come from? Where's it gone to? And then com complicating features. So that normally means looking at airway and looking at your blood vessels in terms of arteries and veins. Okay, so that's how we tend to get our juniors to structure their reports. <clears throat> okay, final case. And then we'll can see there are a few questions. So uh, in Whitechapel, I think we know the lockdown is coming to an end because we started seeing a spike again in um, some of our traumas. So this is a classical um, uh, kind of stab injury that we're going to start seeing again kind of more frequently, unfortunately. So this for our next stabbings, I know you had, you had a talk from Jay uh, a, a, few, a few weeks ago. So we, we slightly changed the technique on our CT scans. The CT scan I showed you, these were a, a, an ENT neck and we give contrast and we give it a delay of about 90 seconds. So it's a kind of a delayed kind of vena, mainly venous phase scan. When we've got neck stabbings, we change that. So you can see here, we've given contrast and most of the contrast is in the arteries. So this is a CT angiogram. So we kind of change the timings. This is much earlier phase of scanning. So we do the um, CT angiogram from the arch up to the level of the circle of Willis, uh, mainly because it'll give us soft tissue information and we want to know if there's a, an arterial vascular injury. As you can see here, we're not gonna give you much in the way of venous information. So with these penetrating neck traumas, 
Um, picking up on venous injuries, partly guided by yourselves, is there an expanding um, mass that could be caused by a jugular breach? And also, can we see any stranding around it, any locules of gas around the vein? Okay, but um, so if we start off, again, um, for our next stabbings, we kind of just tell our juniors to just keep an ABC approach. So always start with the airway and breathing first. So provided the patient's stable enough to come around here, comment on the airway. So here you can see they've been, um, they've got a tube in, so uh, tracheostomy has gone down. You can probably see the tube's probably gone a little bit too low. It's going down into that right main bronchus, probably needs to be withdrawn. So if you start at the airway, again, thinking of your friendly ENT surgeons, can you tell them, is there anything from the compromising, anything from the inside? Is there a big hematoma or um, anything that could be com compromising the airway from the inside? Here you can see, and it'll come on to the next space anatomy again, is the surgical emphysema. So here you can see, I've slightly changed the window, so you can see there's all this gas, okay? And you can see how this gas can then track into the various neck spaces. Um, you've got some gas there in the perivertebral space coming up around that visceral space, retropharyngeal space, and you can see how that's tracked up all the way up to the skull base. So you know there has to be a breach somewhere to cause the air leak. Uh, now that, for a radiologist, can be really difficult. So we're then, we're slightly reliant on you guys telling us where they've been stabbed, what they've been stabbed with, what you think the wound trajectory here, you can see this is a penetrating neck trauma. It's breached the platysma at that location. So you know there's a significant wound there. You can see a big divot. So they're probably the breach of the upper irredigestive tract is probably in the region of the kind of thyrohyoid membrane and larynx here. But as you said, it can be very difficult to see an actual focal defect on a, on a scan. And often when they're lying flat, the defects will seal off. So here I can tell you, kind of airway that probably the tube needs to be pulled back but nothing really from the inside there's no big hematomas again looking at the different frameworks in terms of your visceral space remember you've got the hyoid bone is the hyoid bone intact what does my larynx look like any displaced fractures yes no and looking at the cricoid arytenoids is everything normally aligned yes no so that's airway and then don't forget the trachea following it all the way down looking for any def defects so that covers airway and breathing Circulation now is then is, is a systematic approach looking at all the arterial vessels. So if we start off here, I'm going to show you the normal side. So starting off here at the arch, there's the left common, left common carotid artery. You'll see it bifurcating, splitting into two. And again, there's a little bit of calcific plaque. And what you want to see, I'm going to magnify that. It's probably um, just to make it easier. So you want to see nice, good contrast to pacification. There's a little bit of pre-existing plaque, but you want to see nice round, a nice round tube there with homogeneous enhancement with the contrast. So that's your carotid vessel. Don't forget you're looking at your verts. We've had a few stab injuries where the, the blade is so long, it goes all the way down and gives you a vertebral artery dissection. So there's the vertebral artery, follow all the way up. Again, that looks perfect. Beautiful view following all the way up and then it pierces the dura, goes into that posterior fossa. So that's normal vessels on the right side. And here on the right side, if we look first, there's a right common. So if we follow that up, follow that up, you can see here all this gas. You can see how that's then tracked around. There's the esophagus, so it's gonna be a high risk of potential esophageal injury. Um, when you're looking at the perivertebral space, remember with these deep neck stabbings, one of the things we can easily miss is if, if particularly if it's a bit more lateral, the blades can go all the way down into the spinal canal, particularly if you've been stabbed from the back with little gaps between your laminae, stab injuries can go all the way down to the, the level of the spinal cord. So if we track here, the, a lot of this gas has come around the visceral space, and then you can see gas very close to that carotid space. Yeah, so you've got gas here around the carotid space, and here you can see the vessels abnormal. Yeah, so carotid, carotid, you follow it up, and then it really irregular here. I know you've got some streak artifact, but that's more than artifact, that's a vascular, that's an arterial dissection. It's a little flap in there. Yeah. So the injuries that you're going to see with these neck stabbings are little outpouching pseudoaneurysms. Is there a complete occlusion? Yes, no. If there's not a complete occlusion, is there, a, we'd call this a kind of a non-occlusive vascular dissection. The outline's irregular, you can get pseudoaneurysms. And in really rare cases, sometimes you can get fistulation. So the arterial blood can then go into your upper irredigestive tract or your venous system. But follow all the way up and then the rest of the vessel looks normal. So this was an arterial dissection. They also had an airway injury causing all the, the gas. And then again, don't forget, follow that right vertebral as well. So a lot of these patients will have multiple um, uh, neck wounds. 
Okay, and then if we follow it down, again, in terms of the next spaces, in terms of putting in your report here, you can see there's breach of the visceral space. You'd be worried potential injury to the thyroid gland, potential injury for esophagus. Remember keeping them nil by mouth and to assess for esophageal injuries, as you know, do a water soluble contrast study later on. And then if we go laterally into the neck, this is your posterior cervical space. There's some gas that's tracked out to the side. You've also got involvement of that kind of more superficial cervical fascia. There's some locules of gas. So there's a muscle injury of the sternocleidomastoid. So you can see how once you know your neck spaces, you can then start to translate that onto your imaging and give a slightly more detailed, more accurate report. So I think that was it. I hope that was useful. So just to, just to recap, we've just gone through kind of some neck space anatomy, how you can then translate it onto your imaging. And then I showed you a few cases in terms of the, for example, the necrotizing of Titus externa, where you can start putting that level of detail into your report, particularly when you're looking at scans and working out how extensive your pathology is. Okay. Um, okay, so questions. Uh, with regards to, uh, I think you were talking about the necrotizing otis externa, yeah. how useful are the radio labeled white cell scans? Uh, I really don't have, I've only seen one case that Steve Connor gave me. We just don't, we don't typically do them. We don't get requests from you guys. We tend to mm -hmm. clinically, you guide us. They are, they are supposed to be more, uh, they're not specific, but they are more sensitive. So the problem for us with MRI uh, you you may see some improvement, but the improvement number one takes quite a while to 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 see any changes in terms of the our radiological improvement will lag behind your clinical response, and also it'll never totally go back to normal. So you'll have these ab abnormal looking scans that will stay kind of abnormal for a prolonged period of time. You you rarely see any significant improvement. The main thing is to see that it's not progressing. Um, but uh, the I've heard I've been told that white cell scans are more sensitive, but not specific. But they are. If you've got access to it, that's the main thing. If you've got a nuclear medicines department that can do it, um, it is a better guide than an MR. So, um, but as I said, I don't really, I'm not a nuclear medicine. When, when are they actually useful then? When, when, you, when you, they're on, you're treating the patient and you're not sure if the patient's improving, yes, no. If you've got, if they've been okay. on antibiotics for a prolonged period of time, it, it's a question of how long you want to continue those antibiotics. If you've got no uptake, theoretically, okay. you don't have any active uh, inflammatory change at that site. So, maybe it can help in terms of working out how long you, you treat the patient for. So it's not when, because um, I, I don't know why I thought that if your CT scan and your MRI were normal and you still had a high index of uh, suspicion, is that uh, when you would use it? No, I, I wouldn't, because the, uh, the MRs are so, uh, the, the CTs in particular give you exquisite bony detail. You re okay. you, you'll really know if there's a necrotizing otitis external off the CT scan. The reason we combine the both, as I showed you, you kind of, our temporal bones are really, optimize for bones you don't get much soft tissue detail so the true extent and particularly as a baseline I always tend to recommend an MR sort of for the follow-up so you know what it looked like to begin with but um, if you've got high index of suspicion and you've got a normal CT and normal MR I, I personally wouldn't go for a white cell scan I don't think you need it okay okay great thank you and with regards to the same case the second um, Yep. Was that face? Was the facial nerve involved in that? No, case? it wasn't. That was that was to, to show you that um, it, it often is, but that it just shows you how the pattern spread can vary. I think I showed you the um, stylomastoid foramen, which mm. oops, sorry, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if I show you on that T1, that's why the T1, the the pre, we always do this without any fancy contrast or fat saturation. So if you look there, that's the protid, and all the way up. You can see it's going to be very close. So it may not be involved in the extracranial facial nerve, but if you go further up, it's more than likely that if they did have a facial palsy, it was in the mastoid segment of that facial nerve, as opposed to the extracranial, because actually the protein gland looked normal. But um, most of these patients will, will present with facial nerve palsies, and that's, you'll often see more inflammation around that kind of stylomastoid foramen. But mm -hmm. this happened to spread more kind of anteriorly and medially, and you can see how this is really horrible. It's really a risk of injury to the vessel. But, um, okay. I, I can't remember if they had a facial nerve palsy. They, they may have done, but it's all been anonymized. So, uh, I, and I'm a radiologist as well. I don't remember names. So, um, yeah. okay. Um, okay. So with regards to the plain film x-ray you showed for the case two, yep. was there a telltale sign that would um, point you to not putting in a needle to the pharynx? 
um, with regards to the inflamed calcified tendon as a source of infection? Uh, that's very difficult. We, we, often, we often get, you, 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 if, even if you put in a needle, you're going to get a dry tap and then you'll, you'll probably end up going to do, doing a CT scan. I think clinically, I'm not in your position. I've been told it looks very similar. All of this looked really reddened and inflamed. There was an elevated CRP. There was sore throat pain with swallowing. I, I'm afraid here you would be perfectly reasonable in terms of if you think that's pus, putting a needle in. I think the benefit you have is um, the reason we, why we like to get CTs is mainly to look at the extent and that kind of nails the diagnosis in this case. And often we only see about one or two of these cases per year. So they're, not, they're really not very common. But I think you wouldn't be criticized if you did put a needle into the back of the neck. Uh, you would be if you'd looked at the CT, but on a plain film, I think that's, that, could well, that could well be, there could well be pus here. Uh, the thing that would help you confirming if it was pus, if there was gas, and if it was more bulbous, so maybe fluid or gas here, but I don't think you'd be criticized if you put a needle, but you're not gonna get anything back because as you saw on the CT, it's not full of pus, all of that's edematous and inflamed. So you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna get a dry tap, mm. okay? The other reason I'd, I, I don't know, I've, it's years since I did ENT. Um, I, I remember freely putting in scalpel blades to drain their tonsils, but since I've done radiology, you realize there's also variation in terms of your carotid. Mm. Um, so you do get, sometimes you get really medialized carotid. So just be really, I don't know, and I've seen a few, well, these are all anecdotal. I've seen a couple of kids who've had tonsils where they've had um, uh, injury to the carotid. So I'd, I'd be, as I get older, I'm just very, a bit more anxious, particularly um, um, looking at the, knowing the variation of the vascular anatomy, I'd be, um, that would put hairs on my chest. Okay. Um, another question about necrotizing otitis externa. I think it's because that was one of the interview questions for the REG interviews, and I, I think everyone's been traumatized. Okay. Um, so it's, is there any value in technetium 99 scanning for NOE uh, following a negative CT and MRI scan if there's a high suspicion uh, of the disease? Uh, you wouldn't be criticized if you did it. Uh, I don't think, but, but my personal experience is that if you've got a normal CT and a normal MRI, it's very unlikely. Um, but as I said, I don't really, I don't have that much nuclear medicine experience. I don't know what the evidence base is. I think that's a hard question, to be honest. It's, um, we rarely get asked it in clinical practice in our meetings, but um, uh, I don't think you'd be criticized because if, if it's negative, then you can say, well, actually there's no, definite no source for sepsis. The um, how easy is it to organize? Uh, straightforward here, but I mean, we're speaking from an ivory tower where we've got a very large nuclear medicine mm. department. I think if you're in a, a kind of a non kind of tertiary center, it, access to that can be quite difficult. Um, mm. So I guess it's just a discussion with a radiologist and see what yeah. they can offer. Yeah, as a, as a head and neck radiologist, I'd be fairly confident if I'd looked at the CT and MRI, it looks normal. I, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't recommend it, but um, I'm open to, I'm happy to be criticized for that but I'm, I'd be quite confident if the bone the canal looks normal mm. and all the tissues look normal um, yeah. um, I, I wouldn't recommend it but. yeah um, okay there's a question which I'm I, the question is is there any role of radiology in draining neck abscesses with, with ultrasound I'm going to rephrase that to deep neck space abscesses um, Yes, as long as you can. The problem with the um, um, ultrasound probe, and this is why I, I, I tend to, it's not that I'm lazy, it's just that if I get a request for a, um, a neck and a collection, I always typically do an, a CT first, because uh, it then tells you, you get a good idea of where it's coming from, so you'll get information on the tooth, tonsils, salivary glands, mm. you'll also know the true extent, so how, 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 how many spaces are involved, but if you've then got a collection that you want to decompress, so if you particularly if you want to take a sample, then yes, you can, as long as you can see it with the ultrasound probe. Now, bear in mind the ultrasound probe, uh, ultrasound trumps cross-sectional imaging for the superficial neck. So remember, you've got a depth of penetration, um, which is pretty good. When you're looking at collections around the upper skull base here, I'd start to get a little bit uncomfortable putting a spinal needle through there, mainly because you're not really going to see the tip of the needle. Uh, but for su more superficial collections, yes, definitely a role for diagnosis. Um, as you know, here in Whitechapel as well, you need to send off things for AFB culture and also being nice to the patient. It's a less invasive. You don't have to, um, I personally, I'm not, I'm not sadistic, but I don't typically give local. I'll just put a needle in and drain the fluid off, particularly if there's airway compromise, you can decompress it and for diagnosis. So d definitely a role 
if it's a sizable abscess, but for deeper collections, uh, be very a be, be, bit cautious when you start to go up at the skull base, mainly because unless you use a curvilinear or lower frequency probe, seeing your needle tip can be quite difficult. Um, mm. that, does that kind of answer it? So I, I would do it, but in the first, I wouldn't use ultrasound as your first screening tool personally. I tend yeah. to do a CT first. CT, but, but yeah. yeah, okay. Um, great. Uh, another question is, if you've performed a CT scan, is there any role of performing an OPG in the context of uh, a dental infection, uh, oral infection, or Ludwig's? No, not really. It's like um, it's not going to add anything. You've driven in a Ferrari. Why would you go back to driving in a, in, you know, in a, in a kind of? I'm not going to be derogatory here. I'm going to be careful. But you've got all the information there on a CT, so um, uh, I don't think you'd have to go back to an OPG. We we tend to have them done before anyway, so mm. we. We don't tend to go back to an OPG after we've done the CT scan. Most of the time, uh, our MaxVac surgeons would have done the OPG first, and then we would have done the CT after it. But um, if you're asking if you've already done the CT scan, yeah. is the role for an OPG? Personally, no. Yeah, yeah. Because I, ha I have to be honest, I have seen that being requested. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't. Yeah. And OPGs are really difficult. OPGs okay. are really difficult X-rays to look at because you get. Um, if you're thinking on the CT scan, if you look at CT scan here, I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen, yeah, you, are. Uh, you get so much more detail on your mandible uh, mm. and, the, and, the, and the pathology and the lucencies versus an OPG, which is a flat 2D x-ray. And they're really difficult. It's easy to miss things on OPGs. Um, yeah. I, if you've done the CT, I, I wouldn't, I don't think you need to do an OPG afterwards. Okay, great. Um, there are all our questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much again. Um,